On April 1st, 2001, a female body is found in Washington Park. On May 15th, 2001, a female body is found in Alton Park. On May 30th, 2001, a female body is found in a rear alley in St. Louis. On June 13th, 2001, the St. Charles Sheriff's Office was called to Missouri State Highway 367 to investigate a decomposed body found along the highway. June 29th, 2001, a female body is found in West Alton Park. August 25th, 2001, a female body is found in East St. Louis. October 8th, 2001, a female body is found in East St. Louis. January 30th, 2002, female remains have been found. March 11th, 2002, female skeletal remains found. And on March 28th, 2002, female skeletal remains were found. All have one thing in common. They've been dumped, naked, and strangled to death. Hey guys, and welcome back to The Rage Room. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most disturbing cases I have personally had to dive into. My name's Amanda, and this is my co-host Karen. Hello, hello. I've had to take many breaks from this case myself. Listener warning, today's episode will be containing detailed descriptions of violence, murder, rape, and torture. Listener discretion is advised. All right, everyone, we are diving into the case of serial killer Maury Troy Travis. Maury was born in St. Louis, Missouri to parents Michael and Sandra. Everything about this case is seemingly confusing due to the fact that this man had no major trauma. Details of his early life are sketchy, but nothing alarming. Maury also went by the name of Toby, was his nickname, and he grew up living in a public housing complex just northwest of downtown St. Louis and attended St. Louis Public School from 1971 to 1975. When he was 10, Maury and his family moved to a small ranch-style home in Ferguson. Public record does show that his parents divorced in 1978, and his mother remarried but then divorced again in 1993. So you say that there was no childhood trauma, but right there, you know, a divorce for really, you know, any child, it has to be, you know, difficult. But just because parents get divorced don't necessarily mean somebody turns to a life of crime either. Right, or create this monster that we're about to witness. And very true, divorce is hard on kids, but not to the extent of becoming somebody like this. Neighbors described Maury as quiet and respectful. Another neighbor said he would mow her lawn without being asked, and he also showed her how to use an electric trimmer. She said that he was a pleasant boy with a soft heart, and he wouldn't hurt a fly. Other neighbors say they have no recollection of the boy. Like, he was so quiet and reserved that they have no memory of him. In 1991, Maury was enrolled as a ninth grader, and in 1992, he was a student at McClure High School. Students also say they don't remember him. The teachers say he was reserved and very quiet. Like, even quiet kids make noises, but they said it was like he was almost not there. He was so quiet. Wow. Travis graduated in 1985 and served two years in the Army Reserve working as a medical and dental assistant. And then he took on a variety of jobs in a local trucking company and even volunteered at a local nursing home. So no history of mental illness, no strange outbursts, just very reserved and almost unusually quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no outbursts, no violence that they know of, just super quiet and reserved. Then in 1987, he enrolled in Morris Brown College in Atlanta a school with 2,000 students, and it was affiliated with the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Once he was established in college, Maury started a $300 a day cocaine habit, and it quickly took control of his life. This is when we start to see the change in Maury. He began stealing and robbed five shoe stores and eventually was arrested and placed in jail. He was sentenced to 15 years. However, Maury began writing many, many letters to the judge, stating he was clean, he had been rehabilitated, He was doing better. All of that stuff that he did was basically because he was on drugs. That was his actions because of the drugs. He says that he's doing well and feels fully rehabilitated. And he also wrote to the judge and stated, you're my only hope to getting out of here. Basically, like, feel sorry for me. I'm doing better. And it works. Mari was paroled and released in November 2000. And after five years and three months in jail, he began living a quiet life again. He moved into a home that was owned by his mother and obtained a job. But it wouldn't take long until Maury would step inside the world of addiction again and begin using cocaine and heroin. On one late evening in July, at 3 a.m., Sheila Fields walks the street and is a known sex worker. 
When a man suddenly pulls up in a car and offers a business transaction, she steps into the car and Sheila's fate was sealed. She would be the one of many victims of Maury Troy Travis. So basically up until now, he's really just a drug user. Mm -hmm. That anybody knows of or that there's any kind of record of. And a robber. Sheila is taken back to Maury's house where they get high together and then he takes her downstairs for their transaction time. And this would be the very last place that Sheila would be alive. Sheila would be taken down, beaten, shackled, tortured, raped, and strangled to death. Wow, quite a jump from mm-hmm. what he was doing. Yeah. Maury then takes her body, dumps her in East St. Louis, and her remains wouldn't be found until July 31st of 2002. It is still unknown, but the police do believe that Sheila was possibly his first victim. And the more that I read, I don't know that that's still plausible and you'll understand why when we get further into the story because he actually talks about his first kill and it doesn't match up to being Sheila and her age compared to who he actually kills. At this time, bodies are beginning to turn up with no answers and no connections have been made. Mari was arrogant and proud of his work and honestly, this is the quickest serial killer ramping session that I've ever seen. Even in all of the um, like documentaries that I've seen and any kind of research, I've never seen somebody act so fast. We're looking at, just to sum- summarize, we're looking at a guy... Very quiet childhood. Maybe some trauma from the divorce. Uh, Maybe he didn't feel accepted. I mean, being as quiet as he was, people did say they didn't even realize he existed. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me he was extremely isolated. Not really socialized very well Mm -hmm. with with his other students, peers, things of that nature. Gets into drugs, uh, starts to steal because, you know, to support the drug habit, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, boom, he escalates into this murderer, rapist, killer. And then it's, it's almost as if he got his power from that first kill. Mm-hmm. So step on the gas. Let's go. Yeah, he does take off a ramp very quickly, and it is really out of nature for him to be so violent in this attack because even police officers, when they arrested him from the robberies, they said he was quiet and respectful and reserved, very polite, out of his character to be this intense. Police found themselves in a whirlwind of brutality, murder, and rape. And this is where we're going to see this ramp, okay? All right. So on April 1st, 2001... Body of Alyssa Greenway is found in Washington Park. She's naked, she's been beaten, and she's been strangled to death, leaving ligature marks on her neck. The only evidence that was left at that scene was a tire track in the dirt next to her body. So how many are we up to by now? We'll go over the stats. Okay. It's a lot. Oh, wow. It's a lot. Okay. Then on April 4th, 2001, a little way across town, body of 44-year-old woman is found near death, but the woman was never able to identify Maury. This woman suffered major brain trauma and is now living with a TBI, traumatic brain injury, for the rest of her life. On May 15th, 2001, the body of Teresa Wilson is found in West Alton Park, beaten, she's naked, and she's been strangled to death. Same M.O., ligature marks around the neck. Then on May 23rd, 2001, the body of a 46-year-old woman, Betty James, is found in St. Louis. She was naked, beaten, same thing, strangled, ligature marks around the neck. The only thing that was different about her was that she had a mark on her left leg, and it was a tire mark from a vehicle. Oh, wow. So you may have backed over her, run over or something. There seems to be a running theme as far as age, isn't there? Like, most of the women were near their 40-year-old range? Right. Okay. Yeah, and they they took this tire mark that they found on her body, and then they tested it with the body of Alyssa Greenway, who they found the tire mark in the dirt next to her body, but it wasn't a match. Different vehicle. Okay. Different tires, different vehicle. Then on June 29, 2001, the body of 36-year-old Verona Thompson is also found in West Alton, just 16 feet away from where the body of Teresa Wilson was. Then on August 25th, the body of 50-year-old Yvonne Cruz is found in East St. Louis, and the police have obtained a biologic material from her. She was also naked, beaten, strangled, and raped. And this is where they get the biologic material from her, which happens to be semen. Still staying within that late 30s up to 50s. So, so far, no young victims, uh, 20s or less. Right. On October 8th, 2001, the body of a 36-year-old female, Brenda Beasley, is found in East St. Louis with the same M.O. Beaten, naked, dumped, murdered by strangulation. However, the police find the same biologic material that was found to the previous victim. 
And those two tests, the DNA tests for those two victims were the same. There was a match. Then on January 30th, 2002, we're going into the next year now, so bear with me, it's a long story. Police find female remains near Highland. Then March 28th, 2002, police find remains of a female discovered in Columbia District. Police began to grow frustrated. The number of victims, the short amount of time, keeps on climbing and there's no leads in the case. All they've got right now is the same MO, right? So the fingerprint, basically, of how I'm going to kill all my victims, what I'm going to do. That's his MO. Then Matching we have semen. Matching semen. And then we have two different tire tracks. One on a body, one next to a body. And there is a pattern also with the age. Mm-hmm. So they're, you know, at, at this time, did they... Even call in the FBI? Not yet. To do a profile? Not yet. Wow. Yeah. I'm surprised. Mm-hmm. In this time, Bill, and we'll keep his last name anonymous, from the St. Louis Post-Dispatcher, the local newspaper, did an article on Teresa Wilson, and it said, Slain woman's life played out along Broadway in Baden. A strong, independent woman fell into addiction and fell victim to a killer. The reporter talks about wanting to give women like Teresa a name other than sex work and to shine a light on the dangers of drugs and sex work. The reporter that created this article then receives a letter in the mail, and it's postmarked May 21st, 2001. In the letter it says, Dear Bill, nice sob story about Teresa Wilson. Write one about Greenway. Write a good one and I'll tell you where many others are to prove that I am real. Here's directions to number 17. Oh my gosh. Search in a 50-yard radius from the X... Put the story in the Sunday paper like the last. So we have some arrogance going mm-hmm. on. He's found his power. He knows that you know, he's taunting them, basically. Mm-hmm. I dare you to catch me. Right. In this letter, he also put a map in, marked with an X, and the reporter thought it was fake, like, mm, someone's just messing with me. But he turned it into the police just in case. And they went looking where the X was, 50-yard radius, and sure enough, Female skeletal remains were found and still has not to this day been identified. No dental records at that, you know, anything like that. Nope. This is where we see a break in the case. Police noticed that the map that was sent was sent from the internet. Oh, so we actually have something, you know, digital tracing now. We can, mm-hmm. we can. A digital fingerprint. Right. right. If, if it's not a handwritten map, okay? Right. Police, the local police and FBI begin working with Microsoft to track the IP address. The map that was used was from Expedia.com, and Expedia was the only site at the time that had this certain particular map. They began a search from the users from certain dates of when the when it was sent, the letter that was sent. They narrowed it down to dates, and it led police right to Maury Troy Travis. It just goes to show you again with the technology we have today. Oh, and it's even worse today because we're, what, 20 years down the line. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just the technology in that time that, you know, you can cell phone ping, you can track binary code, uh, just all this stuff that, we, that you can track. And, you, you know, what happened to the days where you see it in the movies where these people would cut words out of magazines and use gloves. and Oh, yeah, and put and, stuff together. Yeah. But, you know, that reminds me of um, the show Pretty Little Liars because a lot of their, you know, the, the person that killed somebody... A lot of it would be like that, more so than just the technology. But this is where we see a lot of people get busted in cases. It's always a cell phone. Mm -hmm. It's always some sort of technology because it does really bite you in the butt in the long run. Right. So on June 7th, 2002, officers went to his door and knocked. Out comes Maury and his girlfriend in their underwear. And he says, it's 7 a.m. Why are you knocking on my door at 7 a.m.? Wow. Yeah. The police then responded, you know why we're here. Maury shakes his head yes and lets them in the home. Wow. I, the fact that he's even got a girlfriend. That was the thing that struck me. I'm like, like, what? Yeah. So Maury lets them into their house, and that's when everything gets unfolded very quickly. So the first thing they see is the computer, and they go over to the computer, and they're looking, and bam, there it is. He's been traced from the IP address. He had a bunch of rough drafts from the letter that he wrote saved in the computer. And he saved them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. They have the computer now, and then they go on to the filing cabinet next to the computer, and they find a bag. They go into the bag, and it's like a gym bag, like what you would see in a workout bag. And they find duct tape, ligatures, straps, hose-type stockings, and gloves. 
and they also find in the house women's shoes and wigs. So basically, I'm guessing the shoes, the wigs, just kind of like his little trophies. Right. Not only that, but these are all sex workers, and sex workers often wear wigs to hide their real identity. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, they saw that he had gone on the internet and ordered leg cuffs and shackles and had receipts of that, too, also on the internet. He just left quite a trail then, didn't he? All in his home. Mm Mm-hmm. Then police make their way to the basement and uncovered the horror, the true horror of Maury Troy Travis. The basement was covered in blood. It was on the ceiling, the walls, the carpet, the furniture, and even between each layer of paint on the wall. So after one victim, he would paint over the blood... Not wipe it off or anything, just paint over it. So every, behind every layer of paint was another... Blood. More blood, yeah. So the girlfriend, I guess maybe she never went to the basement, or was she involved? That's funny you said that, but we'll get to that. Ah. The blood was collected from the basement as much as they could, and it actually was linked to six different individuals just in the basement. Amongst other things, they found torture devices, including a stun gun, and a collection of homemade videotapes of his killings, his rapes, and his torture. Warning, I'm going to play a small portion of this clip of his video called The Wedding Day. The audio is disturbing and may be triggering. It's about 45 seconds long. If you guys want to hit fast forward, it's totally up to you. I would have to say that is probably the sickest thing I have ever heard. And in watching the video while listening and the visuals, seeing what he was actually doing uh, to these victims, there just are no words. There are no words. Mm -mm. There's not. And um, like I said, this is the edited version that ABC did put out. You can view it out there on YouTube. Um, I don't recommend it. It's not something I would ever want anybody to watch. Anybody that knows this victim, she has still been unidentified. He talks about this being her his first kill, where police think that it was Sheila. So there is really no answer because she's never been found. And he was. He was quite elated with what he had done. Anybody that says first kill was nice, like like it was, like you're eating filet mignon steak, like all that was nice. I my head can't wrap around the sickness, and I guess because I don't think that way, I, I never will. But and he was so calm, like through the whole thing. So th- this guy is definitely the epitome of a psychopath. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, if if you were asking me, I'd say he's just a demon, to be honest. Police were given mandatory therapy sessions after watching the videos because they were so disturbing and violent and everything was filmed. He even raped them with other objects. Him killing them was on all the films and so they had to go through some intense therapy after watching them. Detectives also found blueprints for the basement and it was a plan to create a bigger torture chamber than what he already had, including two holding cells and he actually had paper bids that were coming in of company putting bids in to work on this project for his secret chamber. I mean this guy he makes Dexter look like the Easter bunny. At least Dexter's a vigilante. Right. Like he kills the bad guys. Like this guy there there are no words. There really is no words and that's when I 
took on this case, I did not realize the intensity of how bad it was going to get. And the more I dug, the worse it got. And so it's taken me about two weeks to put this together just mentally. To have to take right, breaks to try from to it. to process that mm-hmm. in your own brain, yeah. Yeah. When police are there, they realize that Maury has two vehicles. One vehicle matches the print on Betty James's leg. And his other car matched the tire print that was in the dirt next to Alyssa's body. Police talked to Maury's girlfriend and she said she had never been in the basement and had no idea what was going on down there. To me, I find that really unbelievable. I'm just going to throw it out there. Judge me. I, it is what it is. I find it really yeah, unbelievable. I, what woman doesn't explore somebody's house? Yeah. But. Yeah, I, 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 I can't. Yeah. I'm yeah. not buying that one myself. I'm not buying it either, but that's it. That's all we know about the girlfriend. She's moved on. Yeah. Maury's arrested and taken in and police state that he was pure evil in the interview process. He wanted to be in control of the process the entire time. So, like, they asked him, did you have a bad childhood? And he's like, did you have a bad childhood? Like, he would just repeatedly answer a question where the question was in control of the entire process. And they didn't want to push him because he's claimed 17 victims. They've only found 10. Right. Right? So there's more victims out there. They have no idea where these women are. So they're trying to get him to, like, talk a little bit. And not press him like, we've got you, you're in trouble. Because but, they definitely want to find out where the rest of the victims are. Exactly. Right? And he talked about more victims in his letter. Maury finally, during the interview process, asks for a soda. And police gave him one. And when he was finished, police sent it off for testing. They grabbed it. Smart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've seen this before on television. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time it's in a restaurant and they snatch it when they're least yeah. expecting it. They sent it off for a DNA test to run it against the semen that was found on the two victims, and it was a match. Maury kept saying things like, I'm not going back to prison. I'm not going back to prison. I'm not doing it. I I can't. I'm not going back to prison. So they placed him on suicide watch. 15-minute checks. Four checks an hour, right? Continuous. However, staff missed two consecutive 15-minute checks and found him in the shower corner, and he had ripped his sheet and his mattress bound his hands, and hung himself. Wow. So he was arrested on June 7th, and he hung himself on June 10th. And they never gotten answers. All these victims, still some that are unidentified, some that have never been found, they missed two consecutive 15-minute rounds on a serial killer. Now who? How do they answer to that? I don't know. How do you answer that? I mean, I've... I've worked in that kind of setting. If you miss a round, you were fired. And they missed two consecutive rounds, 15 minutes, 30 minutes of time, okay, that you've got a serial killer in custody who says things like, I'm not going back to jail, I'm not going to prison, I can't do this, and you're going to miss 30 minutes of rounds? It's strange that there were no cameras set up in, you know, on his cell, you know, mm-hmm. pointed at his cell. Because wouldn't a suicide watch, you know, instead of just walking through, there would be cameras? 24-7, yeah. I mean, I would think. think. Yeah. At least that's the way that it shows it in the movies. Maybe it's not in real life. I don't know. But I know that the community was outraged when they found out that he had killed himself. Because now, because they allowed him, by their neglect, to keep that watch on him, they, they actually, you know, allowed him to kill himself. Mm-hmm. Therefore, all these families that will never know no. where their their loved ones' bodies are, mm-hmm. they'll never have any closure that he got justice, or or, well, or justice wasn't served. Mm-hmm. Uh, because honestly, you know, somebody like that, as much of a monster as he was and is. Killing themselves, that's not justice for you. You know, there needs to be a process, go Mm -hmm. through, you know, and... Well, they're owed due process. Yeah. part of the law. Be found guilty Mm -hmm. and and then let the sentencing come down from from the courts. Mm -hmm. Uh, For some reason, I guess that is our our process for closure on on things like this, but... I mean, it's, in a way, you know, you think about if, if they go through due process and go through the justice system... Chances are people are going to probably push for the death penalty. Yeah, or he could have stayed on death row for a number of years. You just don't, you don't know. It's just so... And I'm not really upset the fact that he's dead. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I think that 
He absolutely deserves to be dead. Oh, and I agree. However, you're exactly right that there is so many unanswered questions. There's victims that have not been identified. There's people that haven't even been found. They haven't even been laid to rest Mm -hmm. because he was that selfish, that in control, and so obsessed with being in control that he decided to have that ultimate, basically, screw you, I'm going to... I'm doing what I want. Yeah, I always find myself asking the question, you know, anytime someone commits this type of a crime, you know, whether it's rape, torture, murder, any of that, Mm -hmm. it's why? You know, what compels, other than than just pure evil, that someone is a psychopath and, and, you know, we... You talk about mental illness and things like that. Mm -hmm. But there has to be an absolute pure evil that exists in a living human being. And I I use the word human being very lightly here. Yeah, Um, if that. Yeah, Um, because in my opinion, this was a beast. Yeah, and that's exactly what any any documentary that you're going to see or article found on him... Is it calls him a beast? I mean, he's a monster. He's a beast. He's a all wow. of the yeah. So with the families that did were, or were able to recover the loved ones' bodies, I mean, has anything else been said? Nothing else has been said, unfortunately, because of the line of work that these ladies were in, and a lot of them were into drugs and sex work. There was a lot of relationships that are awry. So there's no information out there. It's very even rare to find pictures of these women. No, that's to try so to put sad. yeah to try to put faces with them. I dug for days looking for these women, and I can't find. I get a few names which have been named. Can't find their backstories. Like ultimately, just been right. Yeah. And people end up in different places in their life for many many different reasons. They do. Yep. And you can't judge Mm-mm. anyone that you know. You don't know why they've fallen into drug abuse. You don't know why. They feel the need or they have to maybe go into sex work. Regardless of any of that, these are still human beings. Exactly. And there are people out there that know them. People mm-hmm. out there that love them. Even if you can't find any anyone or no one could find who they were related to, somebody knows them and somebody loves them. I told you that a long time ago and I've told multiple people that, that no matter who you are, what you've done... You're somebody's somebody. Exactly. At the end of the day, you're somebody. somebody. It doesn't matter what you do for a job, how you live your life. You are loved by somebody, and that is the case for these women, and they don't have any answers. But with that said, even, what about Maury? Right. He was somebody's somebody. He you was. Know? Yep. But, wow, what a dynamic. I mean, it, how, yeah. how could you have any love or, or empathy for someone that can do those types of things? It's it's. Well, I'm about, I'm about to blow your mind, so... Hold on, we're not done with our story. I was just going to say, my mind is already blown, so. (laughs) So, um, you know, that is the end of the case for Maury. He's, you know, he's dead, he's gone, and unfortunately we just don't have the answers that we would love to have. However, there have been at least two women that did survive him. One that I told you about living with permanent brain damage, and one that did end up getting away. She ran out of the house screaming, police were called, but she didn't press charges. And I'm assuming because it was a transaction... She was afraid she would get in trouble too. I don't know. That's just an assumption. There is believed to be up to 20 victims of Maury Troy Travis. Hmm. With only three of them directly linked to him. Three. Three. So if he did not kill himself, he would have only been linked to three out of 20. Oh my God. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. His previous friend, Dave, who we worked with, and his girlfriend, Julie... She was an intern that worked for Channel 30 News, and they distinctly remember, like, a conversation that happened with him one time that he asked her, hey, is there ever any covered cases on those killed prostitutes? And I don't like to use the word prostitutes, but that's verbatim what he said. And he said a friend told him that he knew of bodies being dumped. So she went to her boss. Wow. And said she specifically remembered him saying the word serial killer at one point in that conversation. And she did pitch it to her boss, but there was no data. There was no information. So they didn't do the story. Nothing to back it up, right? Yeah. Fast forward to a woman named Katrina McGall. She found a cute little home that was for rent and decided to take a look. The landlord shows her the house and even gives her the dining room table that was in the house saying, hey, if you like it, you can have it. You know, no problem. Katrina signs the lease and moves in with no issues until one night she's watching a crime documentary. 
and realizes that the picture shown in the documentary was the house that she was currently living in. Oh. Yeah. And there's even a crime scene photo of the dining room table. Oh, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. That she was using as her dining room table. She immediately contacts the landlord and wait for it. The landlord, remember who it was? Remember who had the home? Lori's mom. It's still his mother. Yes. Whoa. And refuses to let Katrina out of the lease saying, you signed the agreement and you need to stay here until your lease is up. No, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Katrina said she had fought her about this agreement, and then finally Katrina said, I'm done, I'm going to the authorities. She goes to the authorities, and they are actually able to help her break the agreement and move. Great. She also stated that it was, like, sick to her stomach when she was living there, when she knew, like, she couldn't... I mean, how could you sleep or Mm -hmm. do anything or just... Yeah. And then she said that her two-year-old relative would, like, randomly look off at something and then start hysterically crying. Like, Uh -uh. yeah. Yeah, and yeah. she said all around it had a terrible feeling to that house. Talk about the heebie-jeebies. There's yeah. no way. There's yeah. no way. I, would, I mean, to me, if they've got that much evidence, whether they could tie these people and find these people that were killed, if they got that much evidence on that house, it should be demolished. I, I mean, it should just be demolished. I agree. I mean, don't we, isn't that a thing? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I mean, That's I think it should be. Not, yeah, I would think it should be, but I, you know. His mother didn't have anything to do with, you know, any of these crimes. Oh, no. She's just like, here, have the same dining room table and enjoy the same murder scene. But with... she knew. Yeah. Knowingly. Yeah. And didn't disclose and that. isn't there a law, like, if you buy a home? But she didn't buy it, though. She I know, but if it. you buy a home, isn't there a law that they have to tell you that, like, a murder happened or somebody died in the home? I'm pretty sure there is. I, I guess there is. I don't know. Does it work the same way? In, you guys know. tell us in the comments. Yeah. Does it work the same way? If you rent a place and they are not open about the history of the place, is that against the law? Or is that yeah, only when you're I buying a no home? clue. I don't know either. But anyway... Yeah. That is the case today, and it is a heavy one, so go have yourself a drink, because I certainly Honestly, needed one is, after this. That's a lot to digest, you know, so that that level of evil. Yeah. It's to process in your brain, yeah. especially after hearing the clip, because it really... It makes it real. We Yeah, we talk about it and, and ask questions and, and kind mm-hmm. of, you know, look into it and all, but, but to actually hear the audible... It's and, painting and, you the and, picture. And watching the footage... Mm-hmm. That you've shown me on it, it's, yeah, you it just really takes you back. Just, there was such a feeling of sickness in my gut when I had to download these videos to put them on my phone so that I could have your live reaction and be able to upload them to this podcast. Right. And it was literally, I remember I was just sitting there and I had to hunch over and like just shake my head and like, I'm relieved now because I can delete them off my phone. Right. You know, but there it's so heavy. And like I said, guys, if you do decide to go watch it, you know, prepare warning. yourself. Yeah, warning. Prepare yourself. It's it's intense and it's it's gut wrenching. But disturbing, yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming back to the channel. We are here every Saturday morning and look forward to hearing from you guys. Also, I am getting stuff loaded up onto YouTube, which will include pictures of our podcast as well, like pictures of the case that we're talking about. So look out for that if you want to, if you're a visual learner, jump on there, subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, comments, drop them down below. Also join our Facebook group. We love to interact with you guys and see how y'all are doing on a day-to-day basis. Whew, I need a drink after this one. Me too. <laughs> see you guys. Bye-bye.